Welcome to the Unitarian Universalist Church of Augusta. We are constantly working toward justice and beloved community through compassion, reason, and respect. Respect for ourselves, for each other, for the planet. Stretching ourselves each moment to model just a bit more love and respect than before. My name is Reverend Nick Filson, and I'm, I'm joined today by worship host Debbie Crane Campanella, music director David Neches, and guest musicians Jim Campanella and Owen Zilla. I am grateful to each of you for your co-shaping that which has worth with me today. If you're a visitor or have been here for decades, you are welcome here. Visitors may find a blue card in the seat pocket in front of you. Um, so would somebody hold that card up for me just so folks can see it? Um, if you could fill this out and leave it at the front table before you leave, this will help us keep in touch with you and, and help you be more connected with us. We look forward to getting to know you and, and we welcome you all. I'll be standing just outside uh, these doors here following the service, and I would love it if you came by to say hi and, and let me know what you think. You're also invited to stick around for some coffee and cookies after the service, too, so that others can say hi. We'll know you by your orange na uh, name tags. Whether here for the first time or the thousandth, I sincerely hope you get what you need today. I'd like to take a moment and, and boost some important news in our interdependent lives together in this sacred community. Our first tailgate rummage sale was a great success yesterday. We had a ton of new folks visit us, and, and uh, some of whom are here today. Uh, and we raised 33% more than our goal for the fundraiser. Thanks to everybody who helped out, but especially to Barb Bowen, Ruth Garrison, and Marika Bhattacharya for organizing the event. Throughout October, we'll be collecting food for the Golden Harvest Food Bank. Please consider donating non-perishables in the collection bins that you may have seen throughout the building to provide meals to folks experiencing food scarcity in their lives. Our last two announcements can provide more info on this annual program with UUCA Roots. Next week, you're invited to dress in a costume for our service uh, on, uh, on Samhain and Halloween. I'm still working out what pun I'll try to depict this year, so stay tuned. Hopefully, it'll be hilarious. We continue to look for a paid nursery worker to help give the youngest among us a dedicated place of their own during each service, if needed. If, if parents want that and if the kids would find that more uh, engaging. If you have any leads for that position, please contact President-elect Marsha Wurst. Similarly, the nursery and elementary faith formation cohort need, need more volunteers each week during Sunday morning worship. Serving the spiritual needs of children is important and integral to their lives, our lives together, but if, if we don't have adults to facilitate that work, we can't do it. If you have an interest in serving our kids' spiritual needs, please speak with Reverend Kim. The social justice team is already doing some cool work promoting justice in the community, fulfilling our mission to do so. Feel free to join our meeting today uh, in my office and or on Zoom and, and stay tuned as we keep everyone updated on important events in town at which we can make our voices heard in solidarity with folks whose voices often go unheard. May we now move fully into our time of worship and transformation, opening our hearts and minds to new liberating ways of being together.
My name is Debbie Crane Campanella, and I'm your worship host for this morning. Today's chalice lighting words are, we light this flaming chalice by Elizabeth M. McMaster. We light our flaming chalice to illuminate the world we seek. In the search for truth, may we be just. In the search for justice, may we be loving. And in loving, may we find peace. Join me as we sing our opening hymn number 129. Words are on the screen or in the hymn. <laughs> of your pastoral care team, in particular representing the congregation's strong support of all people who are facing challenges to their mental health. Now is the time in our service when we invite each of you to come forward and share a joy or a sorrow that is shaping your life. Uh, we're going to start with those in the sanctuary, so please come forward if you have something to share with us today. So now is a time in our service where we do a story for all ages. In normal-ish times, we would have the folks who identify as children come up here, but for now, to continue practicing social distancing, we'll have the, the kids stay where you are, and I'll, I'll try to read from you from here. And uh, today's story for all ages um, is entitled, Don't Hug Doug. He doesn't like it. And it's written by Carrie Finnison, and there are drawings by Daniel Wiseman, and I'm going to try to read along with the video up here as it rolls along. Mm. 
You can hug a pug. Aw. You can hug a bug, maybe. Or a slug. Ew. But don't hug Doug. He doesn't like it. No hugs, please. You can hug a valentine. Sweet. Or a porcupine. Not recommended. Or a Frankenstein. Err. But don't hug Doug. He doesn't like it. Seriously, no hugs. Don't worry. Doug likes you. He just doesn't like hugs. Doug thinks hugs are too squeezy, too squashy, too squishy, and too smushy. There are lots of things Doug does like. He likes to sort his rock collection and try on his sock collection and draw with his chalk collection. And he really likes harmonica bands. Squeak, but he doesn't like hugs. So no matter how huggable he looks, no matter how much you want to, even if it's his birthday, please don't hug Doug. I'm just not a hugger. What about hello hugs? No. What about goodbye hugs? Nope. What about game-winning home run hugs? Nuh-uh. What about dropped ice cream cone hugs? Still no, but I'd, I'd love another scoop. There's only one kind of hug Doug likes. He likes a not squeezy, not squashy, not squishy, not smushy, just right bedtime hug from his mom. Is it bedtime? Are you Doug's mom? No, you're not. Don't hug Doug. Thanks, but no thanks. Can you hug these people? Doug's best friend, Finn, Grandma McGinn, an identical twin, this kid. There's only one way to find out. Ask. Can I hug you? Not now, got to roll. Can I hug you, Grandma? Yes, I've always loved hugs and I always will. Can I hug you? Yes. No. Can I hug you? Bagu, bagu, back. That means yes. Can you hug Doug's pet pot-bellied pig? Ask. Can we hug your pet pot-bellied pig? Yes, she loves hugs, but be gentle. She's a little scared of strangers. Some people love hugs. Lots of people don't. And lots of people are somewhere in the middle. Who here likes hugs? I do. Me too. I'd love a hug right now. I love hugs. I don't. Me neither. Never have. Hugs, ugh, sometimes. From certain people, when I'm sad, on Tuesdays. <laughs> so, can you hug Doug? No. He doesn't like it. Oh, nay, ugs, hey. It's pig Latin for no hugs. But he does like you, and he likes high fives. Doug is a master of high fives. Straight five, double five, low five, side five, spinny five, elbow five, that one's popular right now. Jump five, granny five, piggy five, franken five, and puppy five. He even has a high five for you. Go ahead, ask. Hey, Doug, high five? Yes, I love high fives. And now we can sing the kids to their faith formation time together.
for today's time for prayer and meditation, I'm going to try a little something different, and it, it may not work at all. So bear with me here. Because today is all about asking folks what they need, I'd like to ask you what you need for this time of prayer and meditation. I'm going to do. I'm going to give you a couple options because I think if I just do open ended, it might be too too tricky. So I'm going to give you a vote, and whoever whatever vote gets the most will do that. All right. So the three options are: I I say a prayer to the spirit of life, the mystery of existence, you know, the interdependent web, God, whatever it is that you see as connecting us all, or uh, that is uh, a higher power of some kind. That's option one. Option two is uh, pure silent meditation that I introduce, but then we just sit for a time. Uh, option three is a bit of a guided meditation that uh, I'm going to do something along the lines of a uh, feel, hear, see meditation. And I'll explain that in a bit um, if, if that sounds like something you prefer. So option one is um, what uh, is a, a normal prayer that I do. Option two is just purely silent meditation in which we can just be with our bodies. And option three is uh, some kind of guided meditation. For option one, kind of see folks' hands. So one, two, three, four, five, six. Okay. Option two, kind of see folks' hands. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen. Four, okay. Thirteen. Option three. So one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Nine, ten. It looks like option two carries. That's a little bit too Robert's Rulesies, but um, I thought it would resonate with folks, at least in this community. So I will introduce a time for prayer and meditation, and we'll have an extended silent meditation today, during which I invite you to be with your body, to be with the present, to connect to the ground in any way that uh, works for you. Um, whether it be comfortable with your eyes shut or not, uh, these are all options for you. And I, I want to give you some guidance ahead of time that you will at some point start thinking about random things like what you're going to have for lunch today or, or what you're going to have uh, for lunch tomorrow or if you want to hug on Tuesday. But if um, <clears throat> once that happens, it will. I invite you to celebrate noticing that. Take a moment and celebrate that you've noticed that you've gone off to thinking land and come back and be present with your body and the ground and this moment. All right? Uh, the, the, every time that we realize that we're thinking in a meditative motion, m moment is actually a time to celebrate and not a time to feel like you haven't succeeded. All right? So again, close your eyes if you'd like. Connect with the ground. Notice that there are people around you who are here in love and respect for each other. Be present with this moment as we enter this time of silent meditation.
Blessed be an amen. Excuse me. <clears throat> my dad had progressive dementia for 12 years and lived with my mom in their own apartment with two 24-hour aides for the last two years of their lives together. Mom had crippling, painful osteoporosis and dementia that was caused by many small strokes. Mom's dementia was very different from dad's because she often had periods of decent mental clarity until near the end of her life. Each of my parents had their own aid those two years because my mom would not allow one aid to do the work necessary to take care of my dad properly. My dad was a happy, flirty, very demented person, and my mother's aides, as well as his own, adored dad, and they all told me that they wished that he was their dad. My mom's very advanced osteoporosis and heart failure caused her constant pain and frustration. Mom was jealous of dad's flirting and the love and attention that dad received from the AIDS. Mom was lonely and angry. Mom's way of dealing with all of this was to say mean things to the people trying to help her and be very difficult to get along with. Three years before my mom died, my dad lived four years after. My mom told me that she wanted to divorce my dad. She did not love him anymore. I responded to mom that I understood how difficult life living with dad had become for her and suggested that living separately would be an easier solution for her problem than divorce. I respected mom's need to live separately from dad, although it saddened me. When I affirmed to mom that living separately was a good idea, she was very happy, relieved, and grateful. It's not what I would have needed, but it's what she needed. And by supporting her decision, she and I became much closer and happier. Invitation to generosity. A Greater Good for Ourselves and Our World by Kayla Parker. We know that our financial contributions to this congregation come from sacrifice and hard work. We are so grateful for this and commit together to ensure the funds we, we gather collectively do a greater good for ourselves and our world than they could have done alone. May there be an offering to sustain and grow the life and mission of this congregation. May we give in love and in hope.
thank you for your generosity. We all serve so many roles here, don't we? Before we learn more and discuss the Platinum Rule, uh, I'd like to offer some context to the Platinum Rule by reflecting a bit upon the Golden Rule. Or I should say the Golden Rules, because there are way more than one, even, even within what some folks call the Christian Bible. Two Golden Rules appear a combined six times in the Christian Bible, sometimes referred to as the New Testament. Uh, love, you shall love your neighbor as yourself, and treat others as you want them to treat you. Since the Gospel of Mark was the first canonical gospel composed, and likely the source material for the other three gospels, Matthew, Luke, and John, I tend to look there at Mark to discern the closest to the original intent, or the closest to original story. Likewise, Paul, St. Paul, composed most of the letters that make up the Christian Bible earlier than the four Gospels were written, even though his letters appear later in the canon. Paul was even less removed from the life and work of Jesus than the author of Mark. In Mark's story and in Paul's letters, the English translation of the Golden Rule is almost always some variation of, you shall love your neighbor as yourself including one of two instances in Matthew, this version accounts for four of the six instances of the golden rule or golden rules in the Christian Bible. This version is also found in the book of Leviticus and the Jewish Tanakh, the Hebrew Bible, often called the Old Testament by Christians. Again, the, the original Hebrew in Leviticus chapter 19, verse 18, is generally translated as, love your neighbor as yourself. So, five out of the seven occurrences between the two scriptures, including the four oldest instances of the so-called golden rule, are you shall love your neighbor as yourself. And yet, I most often see or hear the other version expressed in the two remaining instances. The version that says, treat others as you want them to treat you. For example, there's a poster in our faith formation wing that, that shows several versions of the golden rule that appear throughout time, represented through virtually all world religions. Treat others as you want them to treat you is the version included for Christianity. I've seen similar images and media like that with the same quote quite a bit. And that makes me curious. Why do people choose to use that version and not the other? Why do they default to that version? I suggest that the golden rule which focuses on treating others as you want to be treated is often given preference because it perpetuates a system that privileges some folks more than others. It, it privileges you. And quite frankly, it's easier. It takes less effort. The other golden guidance notwithstanding, I far prefer the platinum rule. Now, until seminary, I had never heard of the Platinum Rule. Who here has heard of the Platinum Rule before? Not many of us. Not many of us. Okay, so when I was in my first pastoral care class, it came up in a class discussion, which, which, makes, which makes sense because its guidance is at the heart of pastoral care. The Platinum Rule proposes treat others the way they want to be treated. Treat others the way they want to be treated. The main function of pastoral care is to travel alongside other people's feelings and stories, meeting them exactly where they are, even if just for a moment. Sometimes it's difficult to know what somebody needs at a given moment. 
So the, the best thing a chaplain or pastoral caregiver can, can do is ask questions. Ask what folks need. Ask if it's okay to sit down in a certain place in the room. Ask if they would like me to pray and, and how and to whom or what. Definitely ask if there's going to be any physical touching. For example, a laying on of hands or, or a blessing upon somebody's forehead. Though physical touching is generally discouraged for any reason in this context because of the imbalanced power differential between caregiver and care seeker that can be taken advantage of very easily. If there's any uncertainty, ask. Even if there's certainty, ask. The goal is to relinquish as much power in the interaction to the person who is seeking care, to be led where they want to go and not to lead them where, where you think they should go. And the answer will probably be different for every person you meet when you ask that question. That's a beautiful thing. The platinum, the platinum rule is built in to these interactions. How can I, as the caregiver, give you, the care seeker, what you need? The platinum rule acknowledges that every person has unique needs, especially in a multicultural setting like ours. To assume that somebody else needs the same treatment as you, particularly if you hold a privileged identity like me, this is at the heart of perpetuating a white patriarchal dominant culture and marginalizing, or worse, other less dominant cultures in our midst. Cultures which are just as inherently valuable, but intentionally or not, often denied systemic power and privilege. Treating others as you want them to treat you requires no real bridge building. You don't have to ask any questions of others. You don't really have to ask anything new of yourself. If we think about it in terms of, of medical treatment, if a doctor offers every patient extra strength ibuprofen because the doctor happens to have a headache at the time, a lot of serious issues would be mistreated or untreated. Sure, it would be easier for the doctor to make a, a blanket treatment plan for everybody. Uh, think medieval le leeches. And yet, in the end, it will turn out worse for everybody, including the doctor, who will likely quickly lose their medical license. Now, if the doctor has any interest in doing a good job, they ask a bunch of questions first. Get to know somebody understand their medical history a little better, put somebody's current ailment in the context of their whole lives, parents' lives, even grandparents' lives. Relationship is cultivated so that the best care can be offered. Some doctors don't put in the work to truly listen to the needs of their patients, though, or they simply don't trust what their patient says. Just like in non-medical relationships, this is a problem. We know our bodies and history as well as anybody, and, and when somebody doesn't listen to you, even when it's a doctor who may have more professional expertise, it can be a sign of disrespect. I've most often heard of this kind of thing happening to black women or trans people in a doctor's office, or people who are neurodivergent in some way or another. Once again, showing how treat others as you want to be treated ends up amplifying existing marginalization and powerlessness for some folks. Coercing somebody to, to fill the cup of their life's needs with a metaphorical drink that doesn't quench their thirst is not respectful. A very concrete instance of this is repeatedly asking somebody in remission from alcohol addiction if they would like to have a drink and not accepting their no for an answer. Even if you don't know a person is in addiction recovery, it's disrespectful to continue offering after they have said no once, just once. This, of course, is worse than not asking somebody what they need. It's, it's, it's ignoring the answer and pushing what you want on them anyway. This self-serving power play manifests in other ways when folks usually men, don't take no for an answer, which is perhaps the most heinous example of treat others how you want to be treated.
there's the notion of, of punching up and not punching down in comedy and humor. If you punch up, it's satire. If you punch down, it's bullying. Dave Chappelle punches down with the golden rule in his recent Netflix special, which includes a ton of transphobic material. In his indignant response to folks' righteous outrage over his, his um, hurtful language, Chappelle says, I support anyone's right to be who they want to be. My question is, to what extent do I have to participate in your self-image? To the extent that you want to be a kind, respectful human being, Mr. Chappelle. Now, there is some context to be considered here that will complexify all of this and move us more toward ambiguity right before I end my reflection today. I know, no fair, right? If somebody's expressed needs would be harmful to others or amplify an existing oppression, then it isn't okay to respect those wishes. As always, there needs to be some intentional discernment about power and privilege within a situation to avoid perpetuating ongoing harm. That's my problem with the word rule in general. Context matters. I'm going to go off script for just a second. The, uh, I, I thought about this as after I, uh, I did the kind of democratic process of choosing what our uh, meditative time would be today. Uh, sometimes when you accept majority rule or majority uh, opinion, then that can also amplify existing oppression in a system. Um, you, you have to take into account um, power and privilege and inclusivity when you make those decisions. And sometimes democracy rule is not ultimately the best. So it's, again, context is everything. Cultivating relationship is at the heart of everything we do here at the Unitarian Universalist Church of Augusta. It necessarily includes love, reciprocity, and respect. Respect is a process that requires getting to know somebody better, asking questions, hearing people's responses without judgment. Because of our inherent worth and dignity, each of us, each of us, each of us deserves this from others and ourselves. Cultivating relationship through the platinum rule is a deeply spiritual practice because it lovingly fortifies our bonds within this interdependent web. When traveling alongside others in their life journeys, may you always imagine them singing these words by music legend Aretha Franklin. R-E-S-P-E-C-T, find out what that means to me, and then ask, so everyone involved might blessed be. <laughs> but no, we're doing hymn number 131 is our closing hymn. You all will guide us. And we have some, we have Owen on drums. It looks like the power might be off there. You want to check the power before you? Here we go. Yeah. Good. Here we go. Love will guide.
Yes. Love takes effort. Respect takes effort. May you choose to make that effort with care and joy. Ask people what they need and offer it when you can. And may that offering be a blessing to each of you and the world. Blessed be and amen. folks to come help sing along with our post you only need to know four words maybe five all you need is love you ready owen one two three Without me. 